You're listening to The Jacob Volk Show. He's breaking down the latest and greatest in sports as only he can. Follow him on Twitter at Real Jacob Volk. Here he is, Jacob Volk. Welcome to another edition of the Jacob Volk Show. I am Jacob Volk, and no big games happened yesterday, so there are a lot of previews to do today, namely Heat Celtics, Lightning Islanders, and Bengals Browns. I'll go in that order. And for both basketball teams, there's not much they need to change. I mean, look, the game went into overtime. It was a three-point heat win. The Celtics did play well enough to win. They just saw their best player fall victim to one of the greatest blocks in NBA history. And on the other side of things, the Heat obviously got the win. So, how much do they really need to change? Well, there are a couple things that should be corrected. And I'll start with the Heat. Their bench really needs to get more involved. Outside of Tyler Hero, who had a great game in Game 1. And I wouldn't be surprised if he started tonight. The Heat bench did nothing. Iguodala, in 14 minutes, only had 3 points. Kendrick Nunn, in 13 minutes, only had 3 points. Kelly Olenek in 10 minutes only had 4 points. Guys like Jay Crowder, Jimmy Butler, Bam Adebayo, and Goran Dragic all played around 40 minutes on Tuesday. That's not sustainable. I understand it was a close game. It went into overtime. So the minutes are going to be inflated. But... Spolster was riding his starters more because he wasn't getting anything from the bench outside of Tyler Hero. I mean, realistically, the Heat were running like a five-man rotation. And that's not a rotation. That's just the guys we have on the floor. I like Kendrick Nunn a lot. He made an all-rookie team. I think he's going to have a long career in this league, but in 13 minutes, he can't have four fouls. I'll even throw Duncan Robinson in there also, even though he started. But he was supplanted by Hero as that game unfolded. Hero played 40 minutes, Robinson only played 17. And he only had six points. This guy is one of the best shooters in the NBA. When he's on his game, the Celtics really don't have anyone who can counter that. They don't have as good a pure shooter. If we're just judging on shooting and nothing else, as Duncan Robinson. So that's what the Heat need to do to win this game. They've got to get more production from their bench and Duncan Robinson. Although, he may be on the bench tonight. After that performance by him and Tyler Hero, how do you not bench Robinson for Hero? As for the Celtics, they have to get Kemba Walker's head screwed on straight. 
I understand that Walker is finding ways to contribute. He did have 19 points on Tuesday. That's not bad. But he was one for nine from beyond the arc. I said this yesterday. If he hits just one more three in regulation, which shouldn't be a tall ask, that's it. Game over. Celtics win. It never goes into overtime. The last time that Kemba Walker hit more than one three in a game was game three of the Raptors series. I mean, in the last two games of the Sixers series, Walker was shooting really well. Game three, three for eight from beyond the arc, and game four, four for nine from beyond the arc. And in the Raptors series, games one and three, he went four for seven. Where's that Kemba? Why has Kemba Walker taken a back seat to Marcus Smart? All due respect to Smart. I like Smart. Good player. But you went out and signed Walker to a huge contract. Don't you want him to shoot well? This guy shot 38% from beyond the arc in the regular season. Where's that, Kemba? His three-point percentage in the playoffs this year is 26.5%. That is anemic. That is dreadful. Everyone was talking about the BAM block as the reason the Celtics lost. And look, you can't talk about that block enough. But... Kemba's no-show was equally as important to the Celtics losing. In fact, it may have even been more important. Because again, if Kemba hits one more three, that block never happens. There's no doubt in my mind that if Kemba can get back to being Kemba, the Celtics will easily win this game, regardless of what the Heat get from their bench. Moving on now to Lightning Islanders, and I'll start with the Lightning. There are two things they need to do. They've got to be more aggressive. They have to force the issue a little bit more, and they have to get Braden Point on the ice. It's just that simple. I'll start with the first point. The Lightning really seemed to be dogging it on Tuesday. They were not going all out. You know, they were getting the puck in low and they did have some good chances, but it was a lot of dump and chase, a lot of low shots on the net to try to generate rebounds. That's not good enough to beat the Islanders. You're playing into the Islanders' hands when you do that. If you're not forcing the issue offensively, if you try to turn it into a defensive game, you want to take advantage of the Islander defense, that's not going to work. The Islanders have a good defense. Mayfield and Taze have disappointed in this series, but everyone else, Pelic, Pulak, Green, Letty, and I'll even put Boychuk in there, have played well. The Lightning need to play with a sense of urgency. They fell into that neutral zone trap that Barry Trotz loves. Force the issue. If you see an opening to bring the puck into the offensive zone, take it. I don't care... If it's one on four or one on five, you can't play passively. And Braden Point needs to play. 
I don't know if he's going to or not. His status is up in the air as of right now. But every game that the Lightning have lost in this series, games three and five, points been scratched. All due respect to Carter Verhage, but he can't do what Point can do. He's not that good. And you're asking him to fill in for a great player. I understand that Verhage isn't playing the Point role, but still, when you lose someone like that, that's going to create a major hole on your team, regardless of how you switch up the lines. If I'm looking at this unbiasedly, I don't care how the Lightning get Braden Point on the ice. I don't care if they give him every painkiller in existence. You have to get him out there. It's just that simple. The Islanders do not have an answer for him. In both games that he's played, where he's been available the whole time, he's gotten multiple points. This guy is killing the Islanders. You don't want this to go to a Game 7 if you're the Lightning. Anything can happen in in a Game 7. You have to go all out to win tonight. As for the Islanders, just bear down and generate opportunities. Make Vasilevsky work. The Islanders only had 24 shots in Game 5. They did not play well. The Lightning were just worse. The Barzell breakaway, how does he not score on that? I mean, I'll say this again because it's so incredible. The most shots that the Islanders got in a period in Game 5 was 6 in the second period. There were big stretches of this game where they were lifeless. They were anemic. I think they went something like 7 minutes without a shot. They had three power plays. I think out of the two they didn't score on, they didn't get a shot on net. I admire Barry Trotz's creativity for what he tried to do to get the offense going, but it didn't work. If anything, it made it worse. You can't put that much pressure on your goalie. Varlamov stood on his head. He made some great saves. He stopped 36 shots on Tuesday. You've got to help your goalie out. And you take a look at the chances that the Islanders converted on. One was a power play. Okay, the power play has been lifeless in this series, so I'll take it. That's a borderline miracle. The second one, Kevin Shattenkirk just fanned on the shot, and the Islanders converted on a two-on-one. It was a great pass by Anders Lee, don't get me wrong. It was a great shot by Eberle after being invisible in the three games before that. But if the Islanders don't generate more opportunities, I fear that they won't get as lucky again. Moving on now to Bengals-Browns. Going to be a really fun matchup. Two of the last three number one overall picks going at it. Burrow against Mayfield. Hopefully, this is a harbinger of many more future battles between the two. Both of those fan bases have suffered long enough. When you look at the Bengals and how they played in week one, obviously they got the loss. But you know what? They had an opportunity to tie the game late. 
Burrow engineers a great drive. Starting from his own 18, with just over three minutes left, he gets the ball down to the three-yard line. A.J. Green gets called for pass interference. It was the correct call. But even then, the ball's at the 13. That means it's a 31-yard field goal for Randy Bullock. Any NFL kicker should be able to make that. But Bullock got hurt attempting that field goal. So, it was no good, and the Chargers escaped. But it was really good to see Burrow engineer that drive at the end. That's a really, really good sign. And outside of that drive, Burrow wasn't bad. Went 23 for 36, threw for just under 200 yards. I understand he threw an interception and he fumbled the ball once. But he rushed for a touchdown. And the fumble didn't cost the Bengals much. They recovered it. The guy who I would key in on, if I'm going to pin the loss on anyone, is Joe Mixon. I wasn't impressed with how Mixon played. 19 rushes for just 69 yards? That's a little over 3.5 yards per carry. I expect more from Mixon than that. He also lost a fumble. I understand it's just one game and Mixon's a really, really good player, bordering on great, but you've got to do better than that. The thing that I really liked about Burrow's performance, just going back to him for a sec, He got a lot of his pass catchers involved. Six pass catchers for the Bengals had multiple catches. He got A.J. Green nicely involved. He was the Bengals' leading receiver. He got Gio Bernard involved, which was really surprising. But he showed a great command of the offense. The sky's the limit for Burrow. Make no mistake about it. And Bengals fans deserve it. My God, that is a tortured franchise. They haven't won a playoff game since Boomer Esiason was their starting quarterback. Think about how long ago that was. Not John Kitna, not Carson Palmer, not Andy Dalton. Boomer Esiason. Nothing against Boomer, but... That's not a good look for your franchise. Defensively, Jesse Bates had a great game. So did DJ Reader, Sam Hubbard, and Mackenzie Alexander. Those are the guys who really stood out to me. I understand that the Bengals' defense played well enough to win. They only gave up 16 points. But they were going up against Tyrod Taylor. It's very easy to play defense against Tyrod Taylor. He doesn't have good eye manipulation. And what that is, is the quarterback will look one way to draw the coverage towards that area of the field and then throw it in the other direction. I'm not saying that's easy, but an NFL quarterback should be able to do it. So the fact that the Bengals' defense limited him to 16 points. There's only so much praise that I can give. But when you look at the Browns, I mean, I was listening to Damian Woody kill Adam Gase on Get Up. And Woody said he was watching all the games and the Jets looked worse than every team. Was he watching the Browns? The Browns only scored six points. I understand they're going up against the Ravens. Great team. Fantastic team. My pick to win the Super Bowl. But to only score six points, that's an anemic performance. Mayfield wasn't awful, but he wasn't great. 21 for 39 for just under 200 yards. 
a touchdown and an interception. The running backs were solid, but they each fumbled. Chubb's fumble got recovered by the Ravens. Hunt didn't. If the Browns are going to win this game, they really need to get Odell Beckham and Austin Hooper more involved. The connection that should be there between Mayfield and Beckham just isn't there. It looks like Beckham's just working on his cardio every time he's out there. And David Njoku, a guy who had trade rumors surrounding him, had more of an impact than the Browns' big free agent addition, Austin Hooper. Look, I like Njoku. I think he's a good player. But when you spend that type of money on a tight end, he's got to get the majority of those catches. If you want to get another tight end involved also, you can. But for Hooper to only have two catches for 15 yards is inexcusable. For Beckham to only have three catches for 22 yards is inexcusable. You know, this just goes back to something that I've been saying about Darnold. You can put the best system in the world around a quarterback. At the end of the day, the quarterback needs to have the talent to win with it. I'm not saying that Mayfield doesn't have talent. I like Mayfield. But he has to show it sooner rather than later. He's not going to get another chance after this year. This is his third head coach. Even though Hugh Jackson and Freddie Kitchens shouldn't even be coaching Pop Warner Ball, you've got to do better than what Mayfield is doing. If he doesn't show out this year... He's gone. Defensively, no one played great for the Browns. I'll give Larry Ogunjobi credit. The Browns had 59 defensive snaps. Ogunjobi was out there for only uh, 32. He played well. Sheldon Richardson was good. Jordan Elliott was good. The Browns' defensive line showed up. And we're all talking about the battle between the two young quarterbacks. I think it's going to be interesting to see the battle between the Browns' defensive line and the Bengals' offensive line. I want to see how guys like Michael Jordan and Trey Hopkins and Bobby Hart and Jonah Williams do against this D-line. But I'll tell you, I think the Browns are going to win tonight. I think Mayfield's going to play really, really well. And I think we'll see how great that Browns offense really can be. At the end of the day, there's only so much flack I can give them for getting destroyed by the Ravens. There is logic to, we're going up against a great defense, give them credit. There were a couple more hockey stories to talk about. The first one concerns a really interesting trade. A trade that really took a lot of people by surprise. The Sabres traded Marcus Johansson to the Wild for Eric Stahl straight up. No retained salary, no picks, no prospects, nothing. Just Johansson for Stahl. And make no mistake about it, the Sabres made out like bandits here. There's a lot of turmoil there. Supposedly, Terry Pagula wanted the coaching staff to take 
a pay cut after they had previously taken a pay cut. Pegula is the owner of the Sabres. But Ralph Kruger and his coaching staff said, no, we're not going to do that. Evidently, that's not 100% accurate because Stahl is on a big contract. He's a little cheaper than Johansson, but it's only by a million dollars. If you were going to trade Marcus Johansson for the simple purposes of cutting salary, you'd trade him for picks. You wouldn't trade him for Eric Stahl. I mean, Stahl is on the older side. He's 35 years old. He's going to be 36 when the season starts next year. But he's still really good. He's always been incredibly durable. In 66 games this year for the Wild, he had 47 points. He nearly scored 20 goals. You've got to love that Sabres center core of Eichel, now Stahl, and Dylan Cousins. I understand that Cousins hasn't played in the NHL yet, but everything I've heard is that he's going to come up next year and he's going to be great. That's just what I've heard. I mean, this makes perfect sense for the Sabres. They get a lot better. Eric Stahl is a million times better than Marcus Johansson. It's not even close. Also, the Sabres GM is Kevin Adams, who was a former teammate of Stahl's when they won the Stanley Cup together in 06. And Jeff Skinner spent a lot of time with Stahl with the Hurricanes. You've got to think that Stahl will help get Skinner going. This makes all the sense in the world for the Sabres, I'm telling you. As for the Wild, I don't get this. I do not understand what they're doing. The only thing that I can think of is that Johansson's younger than Stahl by six years. His contract is up after next season. So if he works out, you can re-sign him and he'll still be good for a few more years. And if he doesn't work out, no big loss. I understand that Stahl wasn't part of the future of the Wild. He should have been, but evidently he wasn't. But you're training for a guy in Johansson who, ever since he left the Capitals, has been a shell of his former self. His first year with the Devils, he got hurt. And after that, he's been dreadful. He's had 30 points in back-to-back seasons. That's not bad for a third-line center. But having said that, this guy's making four mil a year. He has a four and a half million dollar cap hit. 30 points doesn't work for me. You want to tell me he was a good playoff performer for the Bruins? You think the Wild are making the playoffs? You know, I like Bill Guerin. I have fond memories of him with the Islanders. Then he got traded, and I was really upset. Got traded to the Penguins. But I think we're starting to see that he may not be the best judge of talent. He's valued Jonas Brodeen over Matthew Dumba, and he's valued Marcus Johansson over Eric Stahl. Why wouldn't you just keep Stahl and then trade him At the trade deadline, you would get a better haul than Marcus Johansson. Johansson's not that good. I got news for you. He's not terrible, but he's just massively overpaid. I can't get past that. Easy win for the Sabres. Should make them a lot better. As for the Wild, hopefully Garen can... Learn how to judge talent. Moving on now to the Canadians. Locking up Joel Edmondson. 
after trading for his rights, they gave up a fifth round pick to get the first crack at signing him, and it paid off. As he is getting a four-year deal worth $14 million. That is a $3.5 million AAV. Edmondson is a good top six defenseman. In a perfect world, that's where I'd put him. You can put him on the top four, but in a perfect world, he'd be top six. He's a really tough player. Plays a sound defensive game. Plays the game the right way. He really, really does. Really good penalty killer. I get all that. Three and a half mil is a little steep for me. I'd have liked it a little lower. But the Canadians really needed to beef up their defense. They really needed to help carry Price. So I understand being a little aggressive. I don't hate this move. I don't love it. On a scale of 1 to 10, I'd give it a 7. It makes sense to go all in for a Stanley Cup with Carey Price as your goalie. Price has accomplished everything else in the league. A Hart Trophy, a Jennings Trophy, a Vesna Trophy... In 14-15, he was incredible. But he lost to the Lightning in six games in the second round that year. There's one thing missing on his trophy case. That's a Stanley Cup. It makes perfect sense that the Canadians would want to make a concerted effort to win one with him. And his window to win is shrinking. It's still there. He's only 33, but... You don't have too much time left. The final story that I want to talk about concerns the Sacramento Kings finding a new GM. They have hired Monty McNair to fill that role. Also, Joe Dumars, who was the interim chief basketball decision maker is staying on as the King's chief strategy officer, whatever that is. McNair was formerly with the Houston Rockets. He spent some time in the G League, then he went back to the Rockets, became assistant GM in 2018, and now he's the GM of the Kings. And look, the Rockets do have a front office that people like to raid. Gerson Rosas, last year, was very highly coveted by a bunch of teams. He ended up with the Timberwolves. And I like what Rosas has done there. The D'Angelo Russell trade made a ton of sense. But having said that, The idea that the Rockets' front office is that great just isn't true to me. I don't like Daryl Morey. I think what he's tried to do hasn't worked. Trying to take away the mid-range jumper. Yet you have Chris Paul and Russell Westbrook. Two players who work best as mid-range players. How does that make any sense? Going ultra small ball. Not anticipating that you'd get matched up against the Lakers. How'd that work out? Mortgaging the future for an unclutched player in Westbrook. How'd that work out? Look, I don't know how responsible McNair was for those decisions. I don't know if he contributed to them. I don't know if he voiced an objection to them. But the notion that the Rockets have this great front office, I vehemently disagree with that. Also, he wasn't the King's first choice. I understand that's not his fault. 
But it does put him behind the eight ball. The Kings had six people who they were looking at. Trajan Langdon, Calvin Booth, Adam Simon, McNair, Sachin Gupta, and Wes Wilcox. Langdon, Booth, and Simon didn't want the job. Langdon and Simon didn't interview with him. Booth did, but then withdrew. That's not a good look. It's not a good look for the franchise, and it's not a great look for McNair either. Again, it's not his fault. I don't want to kill him too much because of that, but in my opinion, it does mean something. And this is a Kings team that really, really needs to win sooner rather than later. Just for their fans' sanity. It's hard to get much worse than the bumbling Maloofs, but Vivek Ranadive has done that. He has been worse. No decision was worse than making Vladi Divac your chief basketball decision maker and watching him mess up your draft. Okay, the Aaron Fox has worked out, but how do you pass on Luka Doncic for Marvin Bagley? All due respect to Bagley, he's not a bad player, but he's not Luka. That's one of those decisions that we're going to look at for a really, really long time. I don't think you can overstate that. I have no idea how McNair is going to do as a GM. You can't kill the hire too much. But I'll tell you, I'm skeptical. Until tomorrow, I am Jacob Valk saying that I was such a dangerous hitter that I even got intentional walks in batting practice.